Do you have this pretty much well set up? Are you are you looking at like an echo in the board? Um, I don't. It, I'm gonna have the screen for this. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm trying to get a room set up where people really can't do it. They can just come on and live stream their lecture yeah. using the board. I, I can't figure out. I don't know how to. I might need to. That's the problem. That's the. That's, 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 that's why I'm doing it. Never mind. My bad. Yes, because it's got to be connected to our computer. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. You don't have a flash over like, here. Flash light, light, no. easily accessible. My phone just set up my phone. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Everybody, give me three more minutes. I'm just going to grab the brains.
Hey everybody, welcome back. Corey, you wanna go over the slide about the internal carotid arteries? Uh, all I was saying here is that the main way that blood is delivered to the brain, fresh ox freshly oxygenated blood, high nutrient blood, there are two major ways. Internal carotids are in the anterior neck, anterior cervical region, the vertebral arteries posterior. So that's how you deliver blood to the head to the brain. To drain blood away from the, from the brain, you've got those dural venous sinuses, and the dural venous sinuses branch to jugular veins, internal jugular. So jugular veins are going opposite of the carotids. And then Emilio, the falx cerebri is the part of the brain that fused together. Uh, falx cerebri is, it's, I wouldn't say it's brain that fused, it's fused together. Falk cerebri is dura mater, dura mater that's fused together. We've got dura mater covering the brain, but then when we get to the longitudinal fissure, on either side it fuses together and it forms this thick, connect, thick uh, membrane that's only in between the cerebral part. What can cause a blockage? Lots of things. It could be a uh, weakened blood vessel. So a, 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 blood, uh, a blood vessel can pop like a water balloon. Um, you can get a buildup of plaque. You can get a clot formed. Um, you can get damage from high blood pressure, hypertension. So there are a lot of reasons why a stroke can happen. <clears throat> cool? Cool, let's get started. So we are continuing with the notes. And as we go through the notes, I'll point out stuff on the brain. And then when we're all done with the slides, then I'll show you on an actual brain because I don't want to keep taking my gloves off. Um, all right. We don't focus on development that much in this class, but the little bit that we're gonna focus on um, has to do with how the brain gets to the shape it is. Can anyone remember in the, in the chat? I'll look out for it, but I'm gonna keep talking. Can anyone remember what nervous tissue, what uh, germ layer it comes from? Which germ layer, which embryonic germ layer does nervous tissue like the brain and spinal cord come from? Our nervous tissue, our brain and spinal cord starts out as a tube, the neural tube. And that neural tube will keep undergoing mitosis and keep differentiating. Some parts grow faster than others. Until we develop initially in three weeks as an embryo, not endo, not endo. We got a forebrain, a midbrain, and a hindbrain. Forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain. It's not endo, it's not endoderm. Remember those directional terms? Not epiderm. Remember those directional terms, rostral and caudal, since we're, we're bipedal, um, the easiest way to describe front of the brain versus tail of the spinal cord. Rostral is front of the brain, caudal is tail of the spinal cord. So we, rostral is this way, caudal is that way. So I could say that the forebrain is rostral to the midbrain, the midbrain is caudal to the forebrain. 
No, not mesoderm. So if it's not mesoderm, it's not endoderm. What's left? It's not mesoderm. Ectoderm, yes. Yes, actually, ectoderm. <laughs> the ectoderm makes nervous tissue as well as which other tissue? Ectoderm makes nervous tissue as well as which other tissue? Nervous tissue comes from ectoderm. And what also comes from ectoderm? Connective is mesoderm. If you answered skin, your integument, then you'd be correct. Your integumentary system and your nervous system. Your integumentary system and your nervous system come from ectoderm. Okay, so part of that ectoderm has it, we form a tube, that tube differentiates into a forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain, and spinal cord. <clears throat> and yeah, Andrea, you're right, yes, integument. They keep growing, that tube keeps growing, the forebrain keeps getting bigger, along with the midbrain and hindbrain. Whoop. They keep growing and differentiating. That forebrain, we start forming different regions. The forebrain is made up of the cerebrum. When we say cerebrum, we're looking, when we look at a brain, when we say cerebrum, we're talking about the major wrinkly part here, not the cerebellum, not the brainstem, and not anything below this curve, anything here, anything rostral, sorry, anything caudal to this curve, this is cerebrum. Cerebrum. Diencephalon, diencephalon is referring to this narrow region, this narrow region here. This is diencephalon. Lateral ventricle is right here, so it's just caudal to the lateral ventricle. It's between, the diencephalon is between the cerebrum and the, and the midbrain. Ectoderm includes integument and nervous system. Ectoderm includes integument, or it leads to integument and nervous system. So cerebrum, diencephalon. The midbrain just stays as midbrain. How do you find the midbrain? Midbrain is this narrow, small region here. How do I know that this is it? See this round bulge here? The round bulge is called the pons. The round bulge is called the pons. So look for the round bulge. Look for where the third ventricle is. That's the third ventricle is in the diencephalon. So between the third ventricle, between the pons, this narrow region here, that's midbrain. You can even see these two little bumps here. Those two little bumps are part of the midbrain. We'll get to what they're called later. So cerebrum, diencephalon, midbrain, pons, the round thing, cerebellum is in the back, and then medulla oblongata. The word medulla, that means middle. As the, as the brain keeps growing, it's kind of engulfing everything, everything underneath it. So the medulla is the center, not really, of the brain. This is the medulla, the, the brain, the, the long part and long narrow part of the brain stem, that's the medulla. Oblongata just means long. I, I might just say medulla because it's easier, but it's a long middle part of the brain. Medulla means center of an organ. Medulla means center of or, an organ. Does anyone remember the outer layer? We went over this term the other day, whether it's the, of the cerebrum or the cerebellum. What's the term for outer layer? I'm gonna look out in the uh, comments. Is that why crocodiles are so angry? Uh, I mean, crocodiles are, are they angry? It's debatable. They're, they're, out, they're out there to protect themselves. The diencephalon, the diencephalon, this is the diencephalon. The diencephalon is between the lateral ventricle slash cerebrum and the midbrain. So here's midbrain, diencephalon, 
lateral ventricle cerebrum. Yes, Andrea, cortex. Cortex is the term for the outer layer of an organ. We're going to see that word come up in other places more than just the brain. Cortex is outer layer. Medulla is inner part. So cortex of the brain could be in the cerebrum, could be in the cerebellum. Medulla is the narrow part of the brain stem. You can see in this animation, the forebrain is getting bigger and bigger until it just kind of engulfs everything. The cerebrum is the largest part of our brain. It's the largest part of um, every, inte uh, every intelligent, highly intelligent mammal, like dolphins and elephants, have very large cerebrums. Um, and it just kind of engulfs everything. That's why you can't see the diencephalon and midbrain from the outside. You have to kind of look at it from the inside. It's been engulfed. So that's why the brain has a, has a shape that it does. The cerebrum grew so much that it's just kind of engulfing everything. <clears throat> Until we get, here's our fully formed brain, an animation of our fully formed brain. <clears throat> to give you an idea again of where, where all these things are found, relative to each other, the ventricles make a good landmark for where we are. The lateral ventricle is found within the cerebrum. So this is called the corpus callosum. We'll get to this in a minute. Here's the lateral ventricles and where you'd find the septum pellucidum. So this is the border for the cerebrum. This is the border for the cerebrum. Where we have the third ventricle, where we have the third ventricle, that's in the diencephalon. The third ventricle is in the diencephalon. Which part of our brain causes the fight or flight reaction? The fight or flight reaction, your sympathetic nervous system, that's largely your, it's, it's in the diencephalon. It's called the hypothalamus. It's this region here, hypothalamus. It's, it's within the diencephalon. <clears throat> um, cerebral aqueduct that goes through the midbrain. Third ventricle in the diencephalon. Here's the cerebral aqueduct. The cerebral aqueduct is going through the midbrain. See these two bumps again? These two bumps are part of the midbrain. So this whole border, that's midbrain. And the cerebral aqueduct is going through it. The fourth ventricle is kind of sandwiched in between the cerebellum pons and medulla. So the fourth ventricle, here's the cerebellum, pons, medulla. It's all this triangular-ish region. That's fourth ventricle. So cerebral aqueduct, fourth ventricle down here. Cerebellum, pons, medulla. <coughs> Okay, <clears throat> nah, I stand. So when we, when we divide the brain into different levels of organization, it's all, it's all arbitrary, but we try to make it make sense. So there are several ways in which we can divide up the brain. <laughs> there are several ways we can divide up the brain. Funny, Andrea. Andrea. Um, we could divide it up into forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain. Um, one way we can physically see that distinction in a fully developed brain. One way we can physically see the distinction between forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain, just from the outside, this. So once again, this is the longitudinal fissure, what separates the hemispheres. That's a longitudinal fissure. What separates the cerebellum from the cerebrum? This is the transverse. Fissure, transverse fissure, longitudinal fissure, transverse fissure. So the transverse fissure, that's separating forebrain and midbrain from the hindbrain. If you want to see the midbrain better, 
Um, I need a different model. Give me a second. No. All right, I'll make do with what I have. To see the difference between midbrain and uh, and the rest, if you're looking if you're looking from a, a posterior view, if you remove the cerebellum, you can see these two bumps back here. See these two bumps? If I were to remove the cerebellum, you could see those two bumps. So Remove the cerebellum, you can see the midbrain from the posterior view. So that's one way to divide it up, forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain. Another way to divide it up is by hemispheres. So again, the longitudinal fissure is what separates the hemispheres, left and right hemispheres. But the hemispheres are not fully separated. They are connected. This, this prominent white crescent band, that's called the corpus Callosum, literally hard body. It's just a very dense. Uh, it's just a very dense connection of. Let, let me quiz you. What if, if this is a connection between the hemispheres? What structure of the neuron is passing back and forth in this part here? What kind of neuronal connection? What do we call the structure passing back and forth? And Ashley, they're called the corpora quadrigemina. We'll get to that. Those bumps are called the corpora quadrigemina. Axons, just axons. Yes, Emilio, uh, what's passing back and forth here are axons. So would this make, would, would, is the corpus callosum gray matter or white matter? Uh, gray matter or white matter? Is the corpus callosum gray matter or white matter? Yeah, it's white matter. <clears throat> Most of this, most of what you see here is gray matter. Here is white matter. We'll get to that coming up. So that's another way you can divide it up. You can divide it up in forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain. You can divide up the brain, left and right hemispheres. You can divide up the brain also by cortex and subcortex. Remember cortex, that means outer layer. Cortex means outer layer. So cerebral cortex is the outer layer of the cerebrum. The outer layer of the cerebrum, if we follow these folds, that's the outer layer. The outer layer is if we follow the folds. That's cerebral cortex. What we can do, what our brain can do in the cerebral cortex versus what it can do below it, deep to it, the subcortex, are very different. And so let's take a look at the differences between cerebral cortex and subcortex. Very broadly, Cerebral cortex is very important for uh, higher order things. Like if we want to think about something, be aware of something, be conscious of something, remember something, pay attention to something, speak, understand language, we're using our cerebral cortex, cognitive processes, very high order, intelligent, highly intelligent things. That's the cerebral cortex. So once again, like here's a frontal cut of the, of the cerebrum. Here's the gray matter lining the outside. The, where you find the gray matter, that's cerebral cortex. That's cerebral cortex. Important for really high order stuff. But we all need basic stuff. And uh, who asked the question about why gators are so angry? <laughs> Emilio? or co crocodiles, whatever, I, I forget the difference. But anyways, why are they so angry? They're, they're quick to react because they don't have a very developed cerebral cortex. What is very developed is their subcortical regions. Every animal, every mammal that has a brain needs a working subcortical region because these subcortical regions are for vital functions. 
basic survival functions for normally breathing, for heart rate, for swallowing, for temperature, for blood pressure, for sleep, for defense. Those areas are more vital, higher order thinking, not essential for survival. Important, but not essential. Now, do you remember I showed you in the very beginning that picture of Phineas Gage, the, his injury? His injury damaged his frontal lobe. Is his frontal lobe part of the cerebral cortex or part of the subcortex? I'm hoping you're saying it's that. Cerebral cortex, part of the cerebral cortex. So he's having issues with all of these things, but he's not having any issues with this. That's why he's alive and fine in terms of overall health but he's not okay psychologically, mentally. It's these things that are fine because this has not been damaged. Same idea happens when people have strokes. Often people, if you have a stroke, you have trouble with language, you have trouble with memory because the stroke often happens in the cerebrum. If someone has a stroke and they die, it's probably because it happened somewhere down here. <clears throat> so the cerebral cortex, since it's so big and so important, we have divisions for that as well. Oh, I know where I can show you. Sorry, I just thought of something. Hold on. <clears throat> Remember this model here? Let me go back. So I, I was looking for a, a way to divide up forebrain, midbrain, and highbrain. Uh, this model, you can see the transverse fissure, cerebrum versus cere cerebellum. This model, we can see, here's the posterior view. Here's the brain stem. Here's the brain stem. And you can see those bumps on the back here. That's the midbrain. Brain stem, here's that bulge, the pons, the round bulge of the pons. You can see this is on posterior view, the dorsal view. You can see those, those four bumps total, one, two, three, four. That's the midbrain. Um, Ashley, if the cerebrum is in the frontal lobe, where's subcortical? So cerebrum, it includes the frontal lobe, but it also includes the other lobes. Subcortical is more, raw, more caudal to that. Uh, so everything that you see here, everything that you see here is cerebrum. Subcortical is sandwiched underneath it all. So everywhere you see the wrinkles, that's cerebrum. Everything else is subcortical. So all of this is subcortical. This is the cerebrum. cerebral And the cortex of the cerebrum is out here. It's less than five millimeters thick, but it makes up 80% of your brain mass. It's all just packed dense in there. Remember, we went over how we have, why we have all these folds. We're increasing surface area to volume ratio. We're trying to pack as much as we can in a small space because we don't want to lug around a huge head. That would be very difficult. Um, right, so we're packing a ton of neurons into a small space so that we can maximize efficiency, maximize the surface area. Remember those pyramidal cells that I showed you the other day? Pyramidal cells, that's what you find in the cortex. Pyramidal cells are what you find in the cortex. They've got prominent branches of dendrites and they have axons, of course, because they're multipolar cells, multipolar interneurons. You find them all over the cortex. Um, there are four lobes. There are four lobes of the cerebral cortex. You have the frontal lobe which very generally is important for things like, did I go over this? Hold on. Yeah, the frontal lobe very generally is important for things like decision-making, um, speech, and also see this right here. This is called the primary motor cortex. Primary motor cortex. The primary motor cortex the primary motor cortex shown here in red this 
does anyone remember the term for not the sulcus? What's the opposite of a sulcus? This protrusion coming up, the wrinkle that comes up. Who can tell me what that fold is? Uh, gyrus, <laughs> gyrus. So, and plural gyri, yeah, G word. Uh, okay, so let me orient you. Here's the front anterior part of the brain, the rostral side of the brain. See? This is called the longitudinal fissure. That's separating hemispheres. This is the transverse fissure that separates cerebellum from cerebrum. But we have names for some of these folds. There's actually probably names for all of them, but I don't know them all. The one you should know, um, see this division between the red and the blue? This sulcus, this sulcus is called the central sulcus. Hmm. This division here, this, this major wrinkle is called the central sulcus. This division between the red and the blue. This fold, this fold here in front of the central sulcus, this is called the pre Central gyrus, pre-central gyrus, because it's before the central sulcus, pre-central gyrus. So shown here in, in red, again, anterior side of the brain rostral, this red part here, the, the actual physical feature is called the pre-central gyrus. In the precentral gyrus is where we find what's called, it houses the primary motor cortex. It's in that primary motor cortex where we have pyramidal neurons that control our skeletal muscles. They, the, the, signal starts, the signal starts here in this red area and it sends out through a pathway out the spinal cord to our muscles. And we're gonna go over that later. But that's one really important thing that happens in the frontal lobe. So this central sulcus is the border. This central sulcus is the border between frontal and parietal. You've got a frontal lobe and you've got a parietal lobe. And Andre, yes, the central sulcus is between the motor and somatosensory. I'll get to somatic sensation in a second. Oh, you know what, right now. Um, in the parietal lobe, you've got a gyrus just behind the central sulcus. So that's called the post-central post -central gyrus. And in the post-central gyrus, that's where you have what we call your primary somatosensory cortex, primary somatosensory cortex. So they're right next to each other. Your primary motor cortex within the precentral gyrus which has pyramidal neurons that signal to control your, your muscles, your skeletal muscles. While in the posterior part shown here in blue, this darker blue, that's the post-central gyrus. And in the post-central gyrus, you've got your primary somatosensory cortex. Somatosensation, that's only referring to touch, temperature, pain, itch, things like that. 
it's does not they were not talking about vision or hearing or whatever other kind of sense it's only somatic sensation touch temperature pain stuff from your skin stuff from your skin somato means of the body sensing from the skin of the body i would have given a different name but here we are <clears throat> frontal lobe executive decision making speech uh controlling controlling your muscle movements skeletal muscle movements parietal lobe it's great for understanding speech and also for sensing from your skin among other things uh Frontal lobe, here's primary somatosensory cortex. Sorry, primary somatosensory cortex, primary motor cortex. Uh, temporal lobe is the third one we're going over. So it's on either side. You've got one temporal lobe over here, another one over here. The temporal lobe, things like smell, things like hearing, which makes sense because your, ear, your ears are over here. Um, smell and hearing are processed in these areas. In the back, the very back, that's your occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is for vision. I know your eyes are up here, but we're going to go over the nervous pathway of your eyes, uh, your neurons extend and go to the back of the head. So vision is over here. Don't do this. If you hit the back of your head hard enough, you'll start to see spots or whatever. You're messing with the neurons over, the, over here. <coughs> Uh, what's my thing? So to identify, um, to identify the central sulcus, and I'll show you this on the actual brain, you want to look for a, it, it goes more, a little more than halfway back and it's, and it's a deep sulcus. So it's easiest to see It's easiest to see when you have a mid-sagittal cut. So it's a bit more than halfway back and it goes deep. So here is the central sulcus. And then you got your pre-central gyrus and your post-central gyrus. So this is frontal lobe, parietal lobe. There is a sulcus between parietal and occipital. I'm not gonna have you know it. It's called the parietal occipital sulcus. Don't worry about it. Um, but the division, the division between frontal and temporal there is a simple way to recognize it. When we look at the lateral view, lateral view of the brain, you see this nice deep sulcus here. Um, wow, I'm blanking. Temporal, transverse, lateral, lateral sulcus, lateral sulcus, there we go. <laughs> this is a lateral sulcus. Lateral sulcus. So you've got your longitudinal fissure, central sulcus, lateral sulcus, transverse fissure. We can use these landmarks on the brain to figure out the divisions between these, these areas of the cortex. How are we doing? Huh? I see that speech is in both frontal and parietal. Do they do the same speech or is it split up? So for speech, uh, if you take psychology or linguistics, you learn about this more. One of these areas is, I'm not testing you on this, but one of these is called Broca's area. Another of these is called Wernicke's area. One's for speech production and the other is for speech comprehension. So both relating to speech, but they're a little bit different. Can I draw out the fissures? I'll try. <clears throat> um, I guess I can still use this diagram. So central sulcus is separating frontal from parietal. Uh, This is the lateral sulcus, so central sulcus, lateral sulcus. Back here, if this is the cerebellum, 
If this is the cerebellum, the division between cerebellum and cerebrum, that's the transverse fissure. Fissure means a really, really deep one. A, a sulcus is a groove. A fissure is really deep. And then the la the um, I'm blanking. I I've been saying it a million times now. Sagittal, longitudinal, longitudinal. The longitudinal fissure is going in between here. So longitudinal fissure would be going in between separating the hemispheres. Okay, so cerebral cortex is gray matter. Cerebral cortex is gray matter. What about the white matter? The, the longitudinal fissure doesn't fully separate the brain. We have connections between the hemispheres. The largest connection is that corpus callosum. What I showed you... I showed you here. The largest white connection, white matter connection is a corpus callosum. <clears throat> there is, there are, there is actually two more, but I just want you to know one more. The other connection between hemispheres that I want you to know is called the anterior commissure. The word commissure means white matter axons, tracts going back and forth between hemispheres. So a commissure is connection between hemispheres. So the corpus callosum is a commissure. It's just not called the commissure. It's called the corpus callosum. Anterior commissure, how do you find that? This is rostral caudal. Here's the swoosh of the corpus callosum. Start posterior rostral, go anterior caudal, and how it kind of curves in like a Nike sign. It start, it's pointing right at, see this white dot here? That white dot is the anterior commissure. Follow the swoop, and here's the anterior commissure. So they're separate things. The, the corpus callosum ends right here, then here's the anterior commissure. In a, in a frontal view, you can see tracts connecting this way. You can see the longitudinal fissure. The longitudinal fissure doesn't go down all the way. It stops here. Corpus callosum, anterior commissure. <clears throat> the, uh, the anterior commissure is right next to the third ventricle and right next to this brain structure here. I mean, this whole thing is called the diencephalon. This region, this brain region right here where I'm wiggling back and forth, that's the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus. And Corey, if you're still here, that was the area that controls your fight or flight response. Among other things, it controls a lot. So commissural fibers, corpus callosum, anterior commissure, they connect hemispheres. Commissural fibers connect hemispheres. Those aren't the only fibers you have in your brain. If we want our hemispheres to talk, we need commissural fibers. <coughs> Excuse me. If we want the hemispheres to talk, we need commissural fibers. If we want to talk within the same hemisphere, um, do I have a cut of this? Just have to use your imagination. If you want, like, within the, within the same hemisphere, if you want this area to talk to neurons over here, we need to form a connection like this. So they're called arcuate, but in terms of their function, we're associating things. So they're called association fibers. Here you can see fibers crossing from one part of the cortex to another. These are association fibers. We're associating within the same hemisphere. Association fibers. And then what if we want to send a signal, like say I want to control my hand, I need to send a signal from my brain down my spinal cord and out to my hand. 
that means it needs to leave the brain. So um, if we want to leave the brain, we go from the cortex, here's the primary motor cortex, and we exit out the medulla, out the brain stem. So if we're exiting, if we're going to and from the spinal cord, from brain to spinal cord or vice versa, that's a projection fiber. So once again, cross hemisphere is commissural. Spelling it right. Commissural association is within the same hemisphere. Projection is between brain and spinal cord. Since we can go from the brain to elsewhere, that's a descending path. We're going down, descending. We can also sense things and have things come up from the spinal cord to the brain. That's ascending. So descending is brain top down, ascending is bottom up. Three basic fiber types referring to the direction and what, what these things are doing. We're either sharing information between hemispheres, sharing information within hemisphere, or sharing information between brain and the rest of the body. <clears throat> I included this picture because it shows a really neat image uh, of those tracts. This is called, I'm not testing you on this, I'm just showing you because it's cool. It's called, it's called the diffusion tensor imaging, if you're curious. You can see all the different fibers. Here's a uh, mid-sagittal view. Um, actually, I'll explain it in a second. Here's a mid-sagittal view. So you can see association fibers connecting within the same hemisphere. Projection fibers start in the cortex and exit down or come up and go up. So projection goes up and down. Commissural, the corpus callosum is a, is a set of commissural fibers. Here's a frontal cut of the brain. So here's the corpus callosum connecting hemispheres. Commissural, commissural fibers connect hemispheres. Here's the anterior, uh, anterior commissure. Corpus callosum, uh, where's the anterior commissure here? I don't think it's shown here, but here's the corpus callosum. You can see the lateral ventricles. You can see the septum pellucidum here, that thin thing separating the, separating the ventricles. You can see the septum pellucidum here too, that very thin membrane covering up the lateral ventricle. Corpus callosum is a commissural fiber. So cool imaging just to show the white matter trap. What do the different colors mean for CT scans? In, in an actual CT scan, um, in an actual CT scan, the uh, it's not colored. So this is, and this isn't CT. It's a different type of imaging. Um, it, so this was falsely colored. Uh, it's just trying to show the different paths, the different commissural association and um, what do you call it? Commissural association. Projection, there we go, projection fibers. Uh, oh, you're talking about in scans like ADHD brains look different. We're actually gonna get to that. Um, well, you know, I can talk about it right now. So you know how we talked about the frontal lobe is important for a lot of things like executive function. When I say executive function, I mean decision-making, um, inhibition. Like for example, if you get drunk, if you drink alcohol and get drunk, you lower your inhibitions. It's because you're affecting the neurons over here. You start doing things that you would normally hold back. In conditions like ADHD, um, studies show that when you show the activity going on in the brain, uh, it's generally, you see reduced activity. And then what, what med medicines, prescriptions like uh, Ritalin or yeah, drugs like that, they help m moderate the amount of activity going on in the frontal lobe. So frontal lobe activity, that's what that's referring to.
<laughs> okay. Dying step one. So we just went over the cerebrum. We just went over the cerebrum. Let's go over the dying step one. Dying step one, that's referring to three brain areas the pineal gland, the thalamus, and the hypothalamus. All together, they make up the diencephalon. Um, here's our image. You can see the corpus callosum. Um, here, this is Ross, this is caudal posterior wrapping around. Um, so there's the corpus callosum. This is the lateral ventricle. Here's the thalamus. That little protrusion, that little round dot, there is a connection of the thalamuses on either side of the brain. Uh, where's my thing though? <clears throat> so th this round, this round region right here is the thalamus. It's called the thalamus. The thalamus is really important for relaying sensory information. Like if, if when I see something, if I see something with my right eye, that information gets passed to the thalamus. And then from the thalamus, it's passed to my occipital lobe, to the visual cortex and the occipital lobe. So the thalamus is a great relay station for sensory information. The thalamus is a relay station for sensory information. You have a thalamus on either side. You have a right thalamus and a left thalamus. But they are connected by, by brain tissue, and that's called the interthalamic adhesion. This little, little circular pip is the interthalamic adhesion. And we can see that in our space fill model of the ventricles. This is the connection. This hole is the connection for the thalamus's thalami on either side. So think of the thalamus as like an Oreo. You've got a thalamus cookie on one side, you've got a thalamus cookie on the other side, and sandwiched in the middle is the third ventricle. The third ventricle is sandwiched in between. But then unlike an Oreo, you've got a little connecting part a little interthalamic adhesion to connect the two thalamuses. <clears throat> so that's a thalamus. Thalamus, really important for relaying information um, back and forth, or relaying information for, for, set, for the senses, for most of the senses. Spell the word, spell the connection word. Oh, interthalamic adhesion. Interthalamic adhesion, yeah. Um, that's the thalamus. Posterior to the thalamus, uh, let me show it this way. Okay, here's the front of the brain. Here's the thalamus. Posterior to the thalamus, we got a little round raisiny area. When we see it, see it on a real brain, it looked like a weird little raisin thing. That's the pineal gland. It's also called the epithalamus. So if you see it referred to that, no, it's the same thing because it's on top of the thalamus. Well, not really, it's outside of the thalamus. Epithalamus, but it's a gland, meaning it is in the brain, but it's also an endocrine gland. The definition of an endocrine gland is something that produces hormones, a chemical molecule released into the bloodstream. Does anyone know what hormone the pineal gland produces? It's important for your sleep-wake cycle. It's important for your circadian rhythms. What hormone is produced in the pineal gland? Melatonin, great, Katrina, melatonin. Melatonin helps re regulate your daily cycles, including your sleep-wake cycle. And that's, yeah, pineal gland. PSH is in the, from the hypothalamus, actually. We'll get to that a bit later. Hypothalamus, hypo means below, it's below the thalamus. Not very creative, but yeah. Hypothalamus, below the thalamus, it's this region here, hypothalamus. <clears throat> thalamus is in this area, surrounding the third ventricle. Pineal gland is more posterior towards the cerebellum. Hypothalamus is this nook right here. This brain tissue is hypothalamus. How can you find the hypothalamus easily if you're looking at the brain? If you're looking at the inferior view of the brain, 
you're going to see an, a crossing of an X form right here. So you can see an X, X. We'll get to what it's called later. But if you look just, if you look where the X is, where the crossing is, look where the X is. Oh, there we go. It's right there. That's the hypothalamus. Look for that crossing and find the hypothalamus. <clears throat> what is the hypothalamus important for? It's important for a ton of things. Um, it is important for fight or flight response, the sympathetic, sympathetic uh, um, action. It's important for reproduction. It's important for thyroid regulation. It's important for um, hunger. It's important for thirst. It's important for, it's more for a lot. Your hypothalamus is like your basic, it's your basic homeostatic brain area. Anything you need for homeostasis, for maintaining your body, for, for, for energy, for thirst, for sex, it's the hypothalamus. It c controls all of those things, it regulates all of those things. Really, really important area. And that's how you find it, hypothalamus. So once again, all these together make up the diencephalon. Thalamus relaying sensory information, most senses, not all of them, we'll go over that later. It's relaying important sensory information, pineal gland regulating sleep-wake cycle, melatonin, hypothalamus, lots of different homeostatic, homeostatic things. Which one's responsible for hormone imbalance? Um, it, it's often the hypothalamus. For many, but not all of your hormones, we're going to get to that later. For many, but not all of your hormones, hypothalamus regulates it. The hypothalamus regulates your thyroid, your liver, your pancreas. No, no, sorry, not pancreas. Thyroid, liver. What am I missing? Adrenal gland. Testes, ovaries. Pituitary. Oh, speaking of the pituitary, <clears throat> well, uh, you can see the hypothalamus is attached to the pituitary. Here's the hypothalamus, here's the pituitary. What does the pituitary sit in? It sits in a bone feature. Who can tell me the bone feature and the bone? What does the pituitary sit in? There's a, and there, that's a hint. What does it sit in? Great, Celatursica of the sphenoid. You look here. Here's the cell, here's a pituitary sitting in the Celatursica of the sphenoid. So here's the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus, um, pituitary, Celatursica of the sphenoid. That's your bone. Yeah, good. <laughs> uh, Right, so that's another way you can find it. So like on this, on this model, we have the whole skull included, the pituitary sitting in the cellular tersica. We're gonna go over the pituitary later because the pituitary is so important for the endocrine system. But know that the hypothalamus connects, connects to the pituitary. This connection point, it's, it's a stalk, like S-T-A-L-K. It's called an infundibulum. Infundibulum. This infundibulum connects the hypothalamus to the pituitary. We'll go over the pituitary later, but the hypothalamus regulates endocrine con control through the pituitary gland. Brainstem. <clears throat> so brainstem, this is your most vital area in terms of Function. You know what? I just thought of something. Let me go back. Hold on. Sorry, I forgot something because I just remembered something from this model. Uh, we have four lobes frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe. Right? Four lobes that you can just see from the outside. We've got primary motor cortex in the frontal lobe, somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe, auditory cortex 
in the temporal lobe, visual cortex in the occipital lobe. So process vision, the visual cortex, process hearing in the auditory cortex, process touch in the parietal lobe, somatosensory cortex, process motor movements in the frontal lobe, primary motor cortex. There is more cortex and it's hiding. Because our brain is so large and folded, because our brain is so large and folded, there is more cortex hiding under here. So we have to peel this open, pry open this lateral sulcus, and we'll see more, and we'll see more brain. If you pry open the lateral sulcus, you'll see more brain. The term for this is insular cortex. or just insula, as an in insulated, it's insulated from everything else, but it's still highly folded, it's still highly folded. Um, right, so that's just one other brain area that I'd like you to know. Uh, it does lots of different things, um, but one thing that it's important for is that it's important for uh, processing helping process smell, but it, it does a lot of different things. We're not gonna go over every single, every single, uh, every single sense. One thing it does is helps process olfaction smell. What do you have to, what do you have to peel back? What do you have to peel back to see the insular cortex? You take the frontal lobe, take the, uh, temporal lobe and pry it open with whatever tools, and then you'll see more cortex. And that's what this is representing. Here's brainstem, but here's insular cortex. Brainstem, midbrain, thalamus is in between here. Okay, going back to where are we? Brainstem. <clears throat> so in this model, here's insular cortex. I'm gonna peel this off. Uh, we haven't gone over this term yet, so I'm gonna ignore that. But here you can see this clear thing. This clear thing is representing the lateral ventricle. You can see the connection. Eh. Lateral, oops, sorry. Lateral connection connects. Here's the inter interventricular for foramen. Lateral ventricle connects. Lateral ventricle connects to the third ventricle. Third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct. Cerebral aqueduct, fourth ventricle. Fourth ventricle, essential canal. So if this is the third ventricle, then this is the thalamus and hypothalamus. Here's lateral ventricle, third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct. It goes in right here. Where the cerebral aqueduct is, ah, sorry. Where the cerebral aqueduct is, this is the midbrain. Where the cerebral aqueduct is, that's the midbrain. And there are those two bumps again on the back of the midbrain. <clears throat> the pons is the bulgy part. So just rostral to the midbrain, rostral to midbrain, the bulgy part, that's the pons. And then the narrow part is the medulla oblongata. So when we say brainstem, we're referring to four things. Midbrain, pons, medulla, and one other thing which I can't exactly point out because it's actually spread throughout the pons and medulla. It's called the reticular formation. So you'll just have to trust me. There are pieces within the medulla and pons that are deeper that make up something called the reticular formation. All these things very generally, since they're part of the brainstem, part of this very coarse subcortical region, they're for the most basic survival functions, things like monitoring breathing, monitoring oxygen levels, 
carbon dioxide levels. Uh, they, they mediate your vomiting reflex, lots of other reflexes, basic, basic things of consciousness are regulated in these areas. <clears throat> Once again, to find the pons, look for the round bulge. Rostral to that is the midbrain, caudal to that is the medulla. Cerebellum, easy to find. You can see it from here, from posterior view, lateral view. You can see it peaking from this inferior anterior view. When we cut the brain in half, mid-sagittal cut, we can see it looks like a tree. There's a term for that, the highly branched pattern that we see in the cerebellum. Those are called arbor vitae, literally tree of life, arbor vitae. The arbor vitae are for sending sensory input to the cortex of the cerebellum. What input are we sending? The cerebellum is really important for coordination, for precision, for accurate timing. So me maintaining balance, walking in a straight line, like doing those sobriety tests, that's your, testing your, your ability of your, your cerebellum to coordinate things. Um, we need to get, to, in order to balance,